Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Mellon CDI, that's the Centre for Disciplinary Innovation Lecture uh, Conversation. And it's my pleasure, I'm Simon Goldman, I'm the Director of CRASH, uh, under whose auspices this event is taking place. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Anthony Appiah and Ash um, Now, the, uh, Socrates, the founder of philosophy, said the great question of philosophy is posed de zer, how should one live? And there are some philosophers who treat this question as, a, as unimportant in philosophy these days. And there are very few philosophers who manage to link the technical skills of a book like For Truth in Semantics to a more general book such as Ethics of Identity or Cosmopolitanism, or an even more general book like In My Father's House, which is a completely different sort of approach, even to Another Death in Venice, a novel. Anthony Appiah is one of the very few philosophers who has a range of anything like that sort. And it's an extraordinary privilege for us to be able to invite him here to come and have a conversation today. And the conversation is with Ash Amin, a professor of geography here, who is also recently about to publish a book called The uh, Land of Strangers. Two years ago. Two years ago, it's already out. The second edition is coming. <laughs> but it does provide a natural link the two sets of work, and it seems to me that these would be perfect people to talk about cosmopolitanism. So please join me in welcoming Ashley Abdiya Rashani. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your introduction, Simon. Um, I must say, this is a real pleasure for me to, to, to have this conversation with. Uh, Professor Appiah, I, I know your work well, some of it, certainly your work on cosmopolitanism, and it's a particular pleasure because we haven't met before, and uh, we had lunch today, and uh, my kind of sense was uh, the common ground there was, was enormous. So I wonder if I could just begin uh, with a, a loosener, if you like, in, that, um, in relation to your celebrated book, Cosmopolitanism. You are yourself, in many senses, a true cosmopolitan. You've crossed all sorts of boundaries of discipline, of ethos, uh, and of continent, of ethnicity, too. And do you think your own biography, well, first say something about your biography, and then in what ways do you think your biography has uh, crept into your thinking in your book? Um, well, it's a great pleasure to talk to you, too, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, uh, first of all, I don't think you should trust anything intellectuals say about how they came to do what they do. Uh, I, th I think we don't know much about how we come to do what we do. I think a lot of the sources of the sort of intellectual pressure are, are unconscious. But um, it is true that I have ended up writing about things that make my own life an easy source of information or narrative in order to tell, uh, to make the arguments or tell the story. Uh, so, and I mean, one way to e explain my interest in cosmopolitanism is to say that I was brought up by two cosmopolitans. I was brought up by my English mother who married my Ghanaian father in the 1950s when that sort of thing wasn't very common. Um, it's very English to call it that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and in fact, the man who wrote the the man who wrote the um, the script for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner said that it was inspired in part by reading about my parents' wedding. So, um, and they, um, but they were both already before they met each other very much interested in people from other places. So, my mother. Uh, uh, as a, a young woman, uh, she lived in Moscow for a bit because her father was the British ambassador in Moscow. Then when the Nazis invaded, she went to Persia and she lived in Persia for a bit. Uh, with my English grandmother, she spent some time in China. Uh, and, and so, and they had friends when they were children. Uh, my mother played with Indira Gandhi as a child. Gosh. <laughs> so they had, they had friends from other places uh, in the family. And, um, and my father, too, uh, had come from 
he was he was born in a, in Asante in Ghana, but he uh, his first real job was in Sierra Leone, and then he made his way to England and studied law, became a lawyer, member of the Middle Temple. But in his work, uh, in his time there, he was in, in England. He was um, very much involved with anti-colonial movements, not just in Africa, but also in, in India. He had lots of friends uh, from India. Uh, he had lots of friends from other parts of Africa, both Anglophone and Francophone. Um, and he definitely thought of himself. In, in fact, he, when he was when he knew he was dying, he started writing a letter to to us. A very old-fashioned thing to do. And one one of the things he said in it was, "Remember always that you are citizens of the world." So he actually, and then he said, "You're citizens of the world because you come from at least two places. Remember that you have roots in more than one place." And his sense of cosmopolitanism, I think, was in part shaped by his reading of, uh, of Stoic cosmopolitanism. My, my father's favorite authors were, this is bizarre for somebody from where he came from, but his favorite authors were probably, uh, I mean, apart from St. Paul, were, were um, Marcus Aurelius and Cicero, and uh, who, and at least in the case of Marcus Aurelius, very clearly had a strong sense of uh, the global connectedness of all human beings, in a sense that so I think, and which he got from Christianity as well, of course. So I think, so I, it would have been odd if I hadn't been a little bit cosmopolitan, given my, given my parents, and also given the city that I grew up in, which though it was the second city of Ghana, was a place full of people from all over: Russians, Greeks, uh, Syrians, Lebanese, um, Americans, uh, people from other parts of Africa. Uh, Hauser people from northern Nigeria who had been settled in our hometown for a couple hundred years, uh, and so on. So, so it would be odd not to be a little bit cosmopolitan in those circumstances. Though I suppose you can react against your background, mm. uh, but I haven't been in the habit of doing that. Because it, it, I mean, that's quite striking in your book. There's this, um, I mean, there are many things which are striking in your book. Well, one of them, for me at least, was this um, engagement with all the, if you like, philosophical ideas behind cosmopolitanism and the kind of history of the idea and so on interspersed with just so many biographical mm -hmm. accounts, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in Kumasi and some of the things that you said that right now and, and it was just a curiosity for me. You know, what are these intersections? When, when does biography you know, yeah. come to the foreground and when does it recede I in think, your thinking? I think it's, it's important that... Uh, I, 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 I sort of feel that a lot of interesting, uh, um, broadly ethical ideas are best communicated through narratives about what it would mean to live up to them. So, of course, we, are, we owe a philosophical account of them, but I think if we're trying to communicate them, um, the stories are useful. So, uh, and um, you can do research and use other people's stories, or you can, just, you can just mine your own experience if you happen to have relevant experiences. Um, of course, if I commend cosmopolitanism to people, I can't commend it because it suits my life. I have to commend it because there are things in it that will suit many lives. And so uh, when I think about these things, I'm, I often ask myself, if I tell this story, am I implying that, um, as it were, someone who's lived the way I have will be able to make sense of this? And one of the things that I feel pretty strongly is that while I have these resources to draw on in these narratives that come from my own experience. Um, the case for cosmopolitanism has to stand or fall on a more general uh, uh, recommendation of it to people who have other kinds of lives. Um, so um, one thing people sometimes say to me is that it's, it's, it must be it's sort of easy for you to be a cosmopolitan. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, if you're raised in the way that I was by the people I was, it wasn't too hard to come to this thought. On the other hand, I think that it's also true that there are people in the world who have experiences in many places who, who don't become cosmopolitan. Who, who, um, so there, there are a lot of uh, people who take their skills in business or accounting and they can apply them in Rio de Janeiro and in Hong Kong and in Mumbai and in London, and they do, but they live a life in which you wouldn't hardly notice that they have moved 100 yards from where they started out. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the mere fact of having experience in a bunch of places 
as it were, guarantees that you will respond to them in the cosmopolitan way, nor do I think that it's true that uh, there aren't lots of people who don't have the other privileges that I've had. So my family, my, both my mother's family and my father's family were, as it were, uh, in, uh, uh, very privileged people in, in the societies that they came from. Uh, my, my mother's father, who was, among other things, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, was called the Red Squire. Uh, so, uh, so he was a lefty, but he, came, but he was also a country squire. Um, and my father's, um, my father's aunt was married to the king where I grew up, so we hung around the court when I was a child. <laughs> so uh, we, we lived, we had a very privileged childhood, and I think privilege, again, money and privilege makes everything easier, pretty much. Uh, but I, it's, it's important to stress that there are people with a cosmopolitan attitude who don't have privilege. There are people in refugee camps who have, in material terms, almost nothing, who are open to the world in the way that I think cosmopolitanism commends. And as I say, similarly, there are very, very privileged people who are profoundly uncosmopolitan. So I, I, while there are connections between, between uh, the things in my life that have made it easy for me to be cosmopolitan and my cosmopolitanism, I don't think that they, there's a kind of lockstep connection between the two. I think that's right. And let, let's come to the idea itself, because of course there are so many different definitions and understandings of cosmopolitanism. And so, so this is my interpretation of your definition. Mm -hmm. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. And you seem to be saying that the cosmopolitan ethic or ethos is about intersecting two things. On the one hand, an obligation towards others who are, in your language, you say, who are not like us. And secondly, respect for lives led in local contexts. So kind of a bridging of a worldliness but also a localism mm -hmm. of sorts. So, yeah. Am I right? That's that? absolutely right. I mean, I think that, so one way of thinking about it is this, that um, there are lots of universalists. Mm. Uh, there are Marxist universalists, there are Catholic universalists, and some of them are cosmopolitan too. But universalism by itself doesn't make you, thinking of, as it were, the, the humanity, I mean, look, cosmopolitan means citizen of the world. So uh, thinking of everybody as fellow citizens of something, humanity, uh, doesn't guarantee that you'll be cosmopolitan, in my view, because one way of being universalist is to think that everybody ought to end up the same, is to think like the, maybe like some of those Marxists and maybe like some of those Catholics, that in an ideal world, everybody would end up uh, pretty much the same, living, living, uh, living in societies, organized in the same way, um, uh, and uh, perhaps even uh, some universalists would say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world state. I mean, some universalists, and you might think, well, a cosmopolitan ought to be in favor of a world state. But, but for me, the point about cosmopolitanism, and this is, as it were, tracing one part of the tradition of this word, uh, is, is the other side, which stresses that, yes, we're all connected. Yes, we have obligations to everybody. Yes, humanity is a moral, is a moral unity. But no, uh, that doesn't mean that the best way, there's one best way to live, one best way of organizing society. And so it goes with um, uh, respect for people's right to manage their own lives, and people there both in the singular and in the plural. Uh, so that in part, this is something that's very much part of the liberal tradition in my way of thinking about it. It, it goes back to, to an idea that is you know, eminently there in chapter three of On Liberty, On Individuality is one of the elements of well-being where Mill talks about the, the, the necessity of allowing people to manage their own lives, to make their own lives, to make their, the, the big decisions for themselves. But it's not just that because, uh, though Mill does hint at this too, but he isn't so clear about it, I think, it's also that people live lives in communities and the communities have the right to manage themselves. That, uh, and that, of course, that produces tensions because uh, the self-management of a community involves the regulation of the individuals in that community, and there's going to be, a, there's going to be the possibility of, of tensions there. And the other thing that I think isn't clearly enough there in, in Mill's treatment of the matter is something that's not surprising that it isn't there because, because this way of thinking really only came into, the, into focus in the post-Second World War period, uh, is the, the role of our collective identities in actually shaping our individuality so that we are... Um, what it is to manage your own life is in part to manage your own life as a man, 
or as a Ghanaian, or as a Catholic, or as a gay person, or, and these collect collectivities uh, infuse what I, what you, uh, Ahmed are, and that's uh, a very important part of the picture. Now, that, that's, so that's the liberal version of cosmopolitanism, but cosmopolitanism is open to difference, so there are other forms of cosmopolitanism which don't start there. All you all you're inviting people into when you invite people into the cosmopolitan conversation, I think, is into a conversation in which we, we just take it for granted that each of us is, is going to uh, enjoy the conversation, enjoy exchange, but not, we're not aiming to become, like, become each other. We're not even aiming at agreement uh, about important things. We're, we're aiming rather to, to uh, converse in a way that makes us able to share the world in a peaceful way uh, but not on the basis of a shared philosophical theory. So my cosmopolitanism, as I say, grows out of this liberal tradition, uh, which I think, um, though I mention it's having a source in, in Mill, um, my father very much also, I think, would have seen it this way. The matter of, he took family seriously, he took community seriously, but he also took the idea that you should manage your own life seriously and respected other people's right to do that. Um, but other people will come to cosmopolitanism out of mm. other traditions, out of Confucian traditions, out of uh, traditions that are uh, rooted in other parts of the world. And all that's required is a willingness to engage without insisting on agreement or becoming uh, the same. And, c and central to this, you say in your book that uh, if you want to if you like, make that connection between liberalism, communitarianism, and a certain worldliness, or looking upon the world favorably, then a core um, ethos is that of curiosity and dialogue. I mean, these, these are two real profoundly key words yes. within, within your thinking. Yes. Time and again, you come back to this need for curiosity and, and dialogue. And, yes. And I'm, I, th I'm think I, I, like, I want to know why curiosity and dialogue rather than, say, uh, a sense of the things shared or, or indeed even agreement. You, okay. You're against agreement in, in the book. Um, I'm against insisting on agreement. The agreement's fine. If you can come to agreements, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not against agreement. But what I'm against is thinking that agreement is necessary in order to cohabit, in order to share the world. We, what's, uh, sharing doesn't, I think, require agreement. Mm. Um, Curiosity, again, this is just, as you say, it's an ethos. Cosmopolitanism isn't, I don't think, best understood as a kind of theory or even a philosophy. It's a, it's a set of attitudes. Uh, and among the attitudes is, is the attitude of thinking. And this is why cosmopolitanism has such a, a long history of connection to thinking about the arts, I think. It's just, the attitude is uh, finding other people interesting. <laughs> Uh, finding, so you could, you could just read English novels, or like Gilbert Ryle, you could just read four English novels over and over again, <laughs> um, or you could, um, you, you could uh, which is a fine way to be, I don't, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that either, but, but, or you could be the kind of person like my mother, who, when she was, um, as it were, instructing me on the importance of poetry as a, as a teenager, she gave me Wordsworth, but she also gave me Basho, of course, in English translation. And she herself wrote in English haiku. Uh, she, um, uh, so she taught me to think of literature, for example, as very definitely something that was uh, enormously important, uh, connected with identity, so that for her, uh, English romantic poetry and its sense of landscape was part of her sense of what it was that she had in being English, even though she was now a Ghanaian and had lived in Ghana for the last 40 something years of her life. Mm. Um, it was important, but also that it was, she loved, she, she was a great, she collected the, the Heinemann Africa Writers series. She read Chino Achebe probably before a lot of other people. She, and we read Chino Achebe as children because it was in the house. Um, she knew, you know, Kenyan writers and Malawian writers and, and Zimbabwean writers. She knew South Asian writers I mean, in the sense of reading them. And, and similarly, though she was 
profoundly unmusical and uh, you wouldn't want to have sat next to her as I often did in church while she was singing. Um, uh, she understood that we, who, her children, who were a little bit musical, would, would want to listen to, yes, we would want to listen to Beethoven, but we'd want to listen to High Life, we'd want to listen to Jamaican music, we'd want to listen to music from many places. That sense of curiosity about the cultural lives of others and the social lives of others, that's part of the temperament. And it, I commend it to people, as I say, not as, as it were, not as broccoli, but as caviar, not as something that is good for you, but as something that's fun, that's a source of interest and pleasure. And, um, and there are people who don't find it so. And uh, having sort of offered them this temptation and they're having resisted it, that's part of the world of human difference too, and I have no problem with them. I give often as my example uh, of, as it were, the people I don't have any problem with who are not cosmopolitan, um, the so-called Am Amish, the, the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and the Pennsylvania Mennonite, uh, German-derived Christian communities. Uh, they're Anabaptists. They don't, they don't believe in infant baptism and so on. They, they, and they don't believe in the modern world. They don't like money. They don't like cars. They don't like electricity. Uh, and they don't really like outsiders very much. Um, but uh, 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 but their, their children are told at the age of 15, 16 um, that they have a choice to make. And the choice is between staying and committing themselves for the rest of their lives to this community or going, which is fine too. That's that's the Anabaptists in them. That's the, you don't make these decisions until you're a grown-up. You can't be, you can't be uh, pulled into the community as a child against your will. You have to know what you're doing. And, and so they have this wonderful activity, which they call, they, they, many of them still speak German, so they call it rumspringen, which literally means something like jumping about. But it's, it's going out into the world as a young person, just seeing what it's like. And some of them come back and some of them don't. I have no, the, the ones who... I mean, the only problem is that they haven't really prepared their children for that experience very often, so unfortunately they have higher rates of alcoholism and, and drug addiction and so on if they, don't, if they don't come back. But, I mean, not yeah, high rates, relatively not, absolutely, obviously. Um, so it seems to me that they're fine. Uh, and, uh, and they're not cosmopolitan, and they don't want to tell me about their lives. I know, I know about their lives because, as it were, people have investigated them, but... But if, if I went to them and said, I'd like to learn about your life, they would say, what's the point of that? Uh, we're not interested in you. Um, and unless you're coming here in order to become a member of our Christian community and to commit yourself to these principles, and even then we might not let you in, um, you know, we're not interested in you. That's fine. Um, so I want a world in which people who make those choices, people who make that choice, people who make the choice to live in monasteries, uh, Haredes in Jerusalem who want to live in a closed uh, Orthodox Jewish world. Uh, I, I have no quarrel with those people as long as they respect the rights of the members of their community, which sometimes they don't. But I think therein also lies the rub. Because, um, I mean, my sense of our times is that um, these are particularly kind of hostile and secessionist times, and almost everybody. I can think of most communities um, really want to see themselves first and probably last too, and are not particularly interested in dialogue or, above all, curiosity. So I'm curious to know whether what that does to your schema. Does it invalidate it? I don't think it does. Um, does it reinforce it? Well, so when the times really pull back into the interior more than Mm -hmm. you know, much, so much of the post-war period, wherever you were in the world, what, you know, what does the cosmopolitan, how does the cosmopolitan respond to that? Well, one thing I think is important to bear in mind is that the slightly longer history of cosmopolitanism than the 20th century, the one that goes back to the Enlightenment and then Romanticism as a response to Enlightenment, um, is a history of, as, as Friedrich Manneke said, cosmopolitan nationalism, mm. right? That is to say, the idea that nationalism and cosmopolitanism are enemies 
which was very much an idea in the 20th century and which Meinecke thought himself, even though he wrote a wonderful intellectual history of the combination of them, he was an early 20th century German intellectual historian. He was in favor of decosmopolitanizing his nation. But he understood that the, that the, the, the nationalism of the German Romanticism had as Romanticism was um, profoundly cosmopolitan. The idea was that, uh, I, I don't agree with all of this, but still, uh, because the way, well, I'll say why in a minute, but, um, but still, here's the idea. The idea is each of us belongs to uh, a community uh, that has a spirit, a geist, uh, which is associated with our cultural production through uh, folk literature and so on, and also the high literature of the, of the great poets. So it's, it's both about folk tales and about Goethe, in the case of the Germans. Um, we have this thing, but so does every other group. And furthermore, um, the, as it were, humanity is a great chorus in which each of these voices is different from every one of the others, but together they make a great hymn. So, uh, so like Goethe himself, who after all wrote the best Oslo Divan, which is inspired by Hafiz, who's a Persian poet, uh, he thought of German, uh, German uh, uh, spiritual geistig life as something that should be shared by borrowing as well. So there would be dialogue. Uh, he said once, in a sort of joke, but it wasn't, um, German philosophers don't really make jokes, uh, <laughs> that, um, that Shakespeare was one of the great German writers. And he meant that Shakespeare was important for German cultural life. So this was not a nationalism of cultural separation. It was a, it was a, a nationalism that, that thought each cultural group was distinctive, but that it had a great deal to, to, to gain by borrowing from across. So it's important to say this, because I think that that actually fits with the form of cosmopolitanism, of course, that I was defending, because the point is, it says each of these localities has something in it worth uh, is likely to have something in it that worth, that's worth defending, that's, but, uh, and it's going to be of special importance to people in that locality, but it's going to be of value to everybody. Right? That's the thought. The thought is, and so if I think that there's um, value in Eve culture and Gikuyu culture and, uh, and uh, the cultures of, of uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, if I think that all of these things contain something of value, then it would be odd to think that what I come from contains nothing of value. It would be odd. It's precisely the thought that I have something to contribute. I'm one of the voices in the chorus of humanity. We, we are one of the voices in the chorus of humanity. That is the sort of cosmopolitan thought. So now, so that's, that's an important point to, th to insist upon in, in thinking about the various ways in which nationalism has become uncosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, the Germans did a good bit of that, um, but but many people have, and 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 in the name of the nation, people have, among other things, insisted on tried to insist on kind of cultural closure sometimes, on closing off from the world. That isn't true of the kind of nationalism of uh, that my father represented, the nationalism of anti-colonialism. They were definitely not like that. Um, First of all, they thought of that as a shared project across the different colonies. And second, they were, the, the, the people like my father were, uh, they, didn't, they didn't think you should just read Ghanaian stuff or just Asante stuff. They thought you should read stuff from all over the world, but especially from other parts of Africa. So there was a level of identity that was transnational. Pan-Africanism was very important in that generation. Uh, but there was also a great pride in the nation, this new thing, which wasn't, Asante wasn't a tribal, uh, an ethnic identity. It was a, it was a political identity, uh, and there was a strong sense that all of this had to fit together with with a citizenship of the world. So um, now it is also true, however, that in in the last, um, you know, in the course of say my lifetime, there have been many uh, uncosmopolitan nationalist responses. Um, that's true of some of the forms of kind of Hindu nationalism that we see in India today, uh, and one could give uh, other examples, of course. So the question is, um, as I say, I'm only offering caviar. So uh, if people don't find it tasty, I don't have any 
philosophical argument to bludgeon them into, <laughs> into accepting this. But my sense is that if you sort of talk to ordinary Indians, while some of them can be um, corralled into a kind of Hindu uh, exclusionism, some of them are, are still curious uh, about the outside. Many of them are still curious about the outside. Many of them have the temperament that says, well, I know we're supposed to be um, focusing down and excluding this, that, and the other, but actually I'm still going to watch uh, uh, movies from... Uh, I'm not going to watch just Indian movies. I'm going to watch some Hong Kong movies as well. So I think uh, part of the sense that there's a... Uh, a great uncosmopolitan form of nationalist backlash going on is to do with the ways in which political leaders can mobilize this in national politics. And it isn't really actually generated from below. It's generated by from above by people trying to manipulate groups in order to uh, in, in a way, mobilize them. In a way, I think that's, that's my point, that... Um in, uh, in the everyday, in the lives that people construct around themselves, they are in many ways ground cosmopolitan. Yes. Because they negotiate difference all the time. And you see this in particularly in the cities of the world. Yes. So there's a kind of de facto cosmopolitanism. And yet, of course, you are also and primarily engaging at the level of ideas, narratives, and things handed across and down. And I guess my point is that in our times, the things that are handed down, the, the biopolitics of our times, are particularly punitive and exclusionary and, uh, and secessionist. Yep. And so um, one has to communicate at that level where it seems to me that the, the, the desire, um, articulated desire, for a dialogue, for openness, you know, for tolerance, for curiosity, is simply not there. And I'm looking for ways in which, um, in addition to some of the things that you say, a kind of a commons could be built, both as part of a narrative, but also in a de facto sense, that we populate ourselves with so many things that are shared, yes. almost behind our backs, you know, such as shared services, such as shared public space, such as the kind of anti-colonial republicanism too, which is so much in the foreground in India and Kenya and Ghana that, that in between um, the, uh, the desire for a cosmopolitan ethos and that grounded cosmopolitanism is a bucket load of hate yes. and, and dislike, which requires something else. Yes. I would, so I recognize that problem. Uh, I think that precisely because there is a ground, a ground level cosmopolitanism, uh, one of the uh, possible ways forward is actually our old friend democracy. I think. I think. Uh, um, but our democracies are in difficulty, in part, for reasons that have to do with the way in which um, we've. I don't want to be sentimental about um, the, the past of, of uh, the North Atlantic democracies, but it does seem to me that something has been lost of a shared, uh, uh, and this is part uh, of a shared sort of common space, and part of this is just for technological reasons, as everybody has pointed out. Um, the web makes it possible to gather together in tiny sectarian groups in which you don't know, you stop knowing how anybody else thinks, and you don't even necessarily know how your neighbors think, your physical, your geographical neighbors, mm. because you don't have to interact with the geographical neighbors. Your interactions are all with a, a, a global community. It could be a global community of you know, jihadis uh, who are not terribly interested in figuring out exactly how their neighbors are thinking if their neighbors don't agree with them. Um, so, so there are technological difficulties, but I think also, uh, there are problems in the North Atlantic democracy that have been created by, by the way in which money, large, large money and politics have come together so that the, the, the sort of ordinary voices are erased by these constructed 
monoliths that are very expensive to construct. Uh, and so that I think most of us, many of us have the sense, the feeling that we're not actually represented in the, in the options that are formally there. Um, and one of the ways in which we're not represented is that we are uh, able at the ground level to live side by side as uh, Jews and Gentiles, uh, Muslims and, and uh, Christians, uh, Catholics and Protestants in, in various places. And um, so I'm, I'm not a uh, constructor of political strategies. That's not my forte, uh, or fort, as we say in America. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, uh, but I think that that's something to draw on. There's, there's a very nice... Um, Example of what I have in mind, and this, which will allow me to make a point about the relationship between sort of theory and practice here, which is uh, many of you probably will have seen a, a, a television program called Skins, uh, and you'll remember that there's a birthday party episode in which the young South Asian British boy is having a birthday party, and his good friend, who's white and gay, refuses to come in because because. Uh, because he hasn't, he's, he hasn't told his father that his friend is he's straight, and he hasn't told his father that his friend is gay, and he thinks this will be a problem. And so the father comes out and says, you know, why are you not coming in? We, <laughs> we've cooked special, we know, that we know the Indian food you like, we've been cooking it back here. Um, my wife has been cooking it for you. And uh, he says, well, because your son won't tell you something I want him to tell you. And he says, well, why don't you tell me? And he says, I've forgotten the guy's name, he says, Mr. whatever his name is, I'm gay. And the guy looks at him and says, you know, Friday is a good day for me. It's the best day of the week. I love my time in the mosque. But I don't know everything. And what I do know is that you're my son's best friend. <laughs> right? So he's not conceding. Right? He's not saying... Uh, he begins by insisting. He's a Muslim, and probably from a Muslim point of view, there's a problem with being gay. But... So there's no, this is not a theoretical resolution. This is the kind of practical resolution that, uh, that allows you... To, to, to live together. It's not a theorist solution. And it, I, I, my uncle Aviv, who was also a Muslim, who I grew in Kumasi when I was a child, was like this. He was incredibly devout, and, he, and it clearly gave great joy to his life, his religion. But he was married to a Christian, and, and, and you know, we, came, we were his nephews and nieces, and we came over. We came over during Ramadan. The kids came over to us for Christmas. There wasn't a theoretical resolution of any of this. Um, in theory, he might have had to think you know, that we were set with a bad fate, and we might have had to think that about him, since we were devout Christians. But in practice, we didn't do that. And I think that um, living with those kind of tensions is something that human beings are, can do, but they can be uh, manipulated by these ethnic and religious entrepreneurs into forgetting that they can do it or in insisting on uh, purity, right? And that's really what fundamentalism is. That's what fundamentalism is originally a Christian word. And that's what Christian fundamentalism was in the early 20th century. It was banging on the table and saying, we're not going to compromise on any of these things. And we're going to be in the business of excluding people and, uh, and looking down at people who who aren't on the inside, and then uh, other people have done the same thing in the names of other religions. Um, you can't, I mean, apparently you can't stop that happening, and especially you can't stop it happening when people are afraid. And the reason they are afraid, even though they may articulate their fear in terms of, the, of otherness, is often not really. It's, it's that they're economically insecure, that they're worried about that, they band together in these small groups, smaller groups, because they think the cake is shrinking, maybe we together can get a share of it, and so on. There are lots of motivations of that sort. But um, so, one, so one has to bear all that in mind. Uh, it's easy to say that, um, you know, Yugoslavia wouldn't have fallen apart if the Yugoslav economy hadn't first fallen apart. I, I deeply believe that. Uh, but, of course, the, the, that's not much use to be told after the event, and building up the economy of the Balkans isn't going to undo, the, nor is it going to wipe out the memory 
of, of the killings and the exclusions. So, um, so I guess I'm just agreeing with you that there's a big problem here, but mm. trying to talk myself into thinking that there's some hope that if you, if you work hard to secure people's, uh, to give people a basic sense of just material security, they can be more relaxed about these other things. And also that um, there is this resource out there, which is the practical capacity people have of living with all kinds of difference without feeling that they have to resolve it theoretically, without the feeling they have to say, I mean, the, the, <laughs> another form of fundamentalism of this sort is the fundamental of Richard Dawkins. It's the fundamentalism of the new atheism, which sort of bangs on the table and insists we, gotta, we, we can't sit down with you until you agree with us that we're right about theism. Well, that's, that's not a way to share the world. Which is why I think, and I want to come back to this, the nature of the relationship between a pragmatism of dialogue and contact, human contact, mm -hmm. and efforts to, if you like, institute the commons yes. you know, through such things as the law, um, universal human rights, yes. functioning services. Yes. You talked about the poor there, and, and right at the very end of your book, you, you know, a very interesting twist at the end of your book, you say, well, you know, we could begin to forge ahead if the basic rights of the poor in a UN mm. kind of style were to be recognized. And I see some of the, the latter gathered around the umbrella of commoning shared public space, how politicians speak about publics and the others, as kind of slightly one apart from the politics of dialogue and conversation. And I, and I want to see them separately because it's, I mean, here's a slight twist in your tale. That mm -hmm. If today all we left with is uh, the injunction of dialogue in order to get up and around in the world, that's placing quite a huge burden on the individual and on individual communities to say, look, for your accession to rights or to identity or to recognition, you've got to enter into dialogue. Um, I, I'm not averse to dialogue, but there are too many things that intervene to stop that dialogue. Yes. So I'm, I'm kind of pushing yes. you in, in, yes. look, in that other corner and, and, and trying to get a sense of whether there's any validity in thinking of a politics of the commons that's not reducible to a politics of cosmopolitanism. Absolutely. So um, many things matter in the world. Uh, to me, the cosmopolitan enterprise matters, but other things matter too. Justice matters. Sure. And, and uh, making sure the, the argument of the last part of the cosmopolitanism book is that here's a duty that we have not as cosmopolitans, mm -hmm. but as human beings. So the Amish have this duty too which is to do your fair share to make sure that everybody in the world can have a dignified existence. Now, that's a formula, and then you have to figure out what the fair share is and how to, and, and so on, and, and that's a big project. But, um, but that's, that's, in my view, that's, that's morality. That's not cosmopolitanism. Uh, and uh, we need, and the dignified existence isn't just about more than $2 a day. It's about living in a society where your voice can be heard. It's about um, access to, to water. <laughs> it's about, uh, I mean, drink, potable water, drinkable water, humanly usable water, and so on. It's about, uh, and these things are not just measured in, in, in financial or monetary terms or material terms. Uh, it's about um, being able to make your choices in the sphere of, of culture. Uh, uh, religious freedom, uh, freedom to be not, not to be religious. I mean, it's about a lot of things. Um, and I do think that it's uh, one of the achievements of the post-Second World War period that even though there's backsliding all the time, and even though some people think that the human rights movement has kind of run out of steam, the fact is that no regime, with the possible exception of North Korea, um, is in the position nowadays explicitly to reject the thought that you can't torture people 
as it were, willy-nilly. Uh, that um, e even the Saudis uh, on paper agree that, that men and women are equal under the law, right? Uh, now, as I say, that's just there's plenty of, of backsliding and there's plenty of hypocrisy. But um, hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays to virtue, as somebody said. And holding on to these values, I think, has been something that has worked and, and gone global. And while um, it's absolutely true that the specific formulations of rights uh, are very much skewed towards a language that developed in the West, you don't have to be a Westerner to think that it'd be nice to be guaranteed that your government won't torture you. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not a Western thought, that's a human thought. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be... Um, to, 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 to articulate things, uh, even in the terms of the language of rights, mm -hmm. to see the values that are uh, being defended when we defend the rights of uh, people, uh, including rights of expression and religious freedom and so on, you don't have to be borrow from Locke and, and, mm -hmm. uh, or the American founding or the French Revolution to, uh, to see the point of those things. And lots and lots of people do once you, once you put it to them, once you say to them, wouldn't it be better if we had a world in which everybody agreed that not just that my country won't do this, but that my country will do its fair share to make sure that no country does it, right? Um, you, you can, again, of course, you won't get 100% take up on anything, but you'll get an awful lot of take up. And this is, as I say, these are, uh, um, these, I'm not making these claims in the name of a cosmopolitan attitude. I'm making them in the name of humanity. Uh, which, and I think uh, someone who denies that uh, has a very sharp hill to climb of argument to persuade people that uh, it's wrong to think that there are certain things that ought to be available to every human being, as it were, because they're a human being, because they have the needs and the capacities uh, and the um, uh, capabilities uh, of, of human beings. So yes, uh, I, I do not think that the cosmopolitanism thing uh, is the only thing that matters. I, I absolutely agree that we need uh, uh, this uh, global politics of dignity that guarantees the baseline. Um, I do think that people who are curious about others and who are interested in the lives of others are more likely to be willing to, be, to pay actual costs for securing these things. I think cosmopolitans are more likely to be willing to sign up for the, for, the, for the global equality taxes that we should be paying in the rich countries. I'm just the last question or issue that I wanted to raise. I mean, I'm inclined to agree with that, um, but I just also think that there are times when, and I think you say this um, in, not so much in cosmopolitanism, but your wonderful book on Du Bois, um, Lines of Descent, that there are moments when in order to make your case, you need to secede from the dialogue. You need to pull back. Yes. Um, and in, in this autobiography, you, sh you said that, well, you know, we can begin to understand why Du Bois then decided to leave the United States to go to Ghana, why he decides to engage with Marx in order to see the class nature of exploitation in black Africa, uh, why he decides to write a history of what blackness means. And of course, the contemporary parallel, for me at least, is what um, some Arab youths are doing yes. in, around the, in and around the Mediterranean, where there's this um, desire to engage in the world by seceding from it in order to be clear about what your own identity yes. is and where you stand. And that requires a kind of, um, I think Sloterdijk uses this phrase, a thymotic rage against the other who exploits, who takes from you, and who has to be constituted in that moment as an enemy with whom you will not enter into dialogue. Um, and again, I want to know whether yes. where this appears in your kind of scheme of things. So first of all, uh, some of that rage, at the very least, is warranted. Um, the government, I'm an American citizen, the government of my country uh, has done terrible things in the Muslim mm. world uh, in sustaining uh, 
uh, regimes that don't guarantee people the kind of basic dignity that I said that we all ought to make sure everybody has access to. So um, one thing you need to do as a cosmopolitan citizen of a country like the United States is admit, listen to the complaints and grant, and grant that they're correct and, I think, apologize a good deal, um, uh, which the United States never does. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of political tradition of refusal to apologize, which, I, which I, I've been in America for a while, I've been a citizen for a while, but I don't get that. That seems to me batty. It seems to me uh, unhelpful and wrong. But, um, uh, and yes, there are moments when you need, uh, where, when, when you're uh, assailed under an identity, there are moments when you need to gather as people of that identity and be allowed to say um, things that are, I think, not, usually not strictly speaking correct, but nevertheless necessary for mobilization. I, my first experience of this happened at this university. I was the only male member of a, uh, medical, a group of medical students who were interested in feminism. And at a certain point, it became clear to me that, that it wasn't helpful to have a man around. I was, I was the only one. <laughs> Uh, better, better for them to be able not to say, as it were, begging your pardon, Anthony, or um, excuse, <laughs> excusing, you know, we, we, we understand that you're on our side all the time. They, they should just be allowed to get on with having, uh, and, and, and some of their complaints, uh, you know, one, at a high level of theory, you would want to have modulated them, you would have wanted to have said, well, that's not quite right, but that, that wasn't what was going to be helpful. And similarly, in the United States. Black nationalism in the 60s and 70s was a very important thing, and it, it, it meant that a lot of white people who were perfectly willing to help couldn't because they weren't wanted. Those are, so there are historical moments when that happens. This is the point about the ethics of identity. Um, and the cosmopolitan curiosity means that you should know enough about other places to be able to see when there are moments when that's what's needed, and so there's nothing you can do except stand back and let people figure something out for themselves. Um, so I have, I understand from these examples. I mean, in my, again, in my own life, but 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 I understand why that can happen sometimes. And again, this is one of those places where um, something that seems kind of difficult to defend in theory works very well in practice. We are not uh, intellectually, even the most intellectual of intellectuals is not intellectually sophisticated all the time about the things that matter to her most. And, uh, and in those moments, in those human moments, one of the things that can happen is a need to come together around something which involves excluding others. I, um, I hope that not too much of it has to involve hatred and rage, mm -hmm. but sometimes when people have done terrible things to you, indignation is the right response. Uh, and, and the fault lies elsewhere. The fault doesn't lie in you. The moral fault lies in the people who've turned you into the raging person. Um, so I, I have great, uh, and I mean, maybe I just say this. I mean, I, uh, so I have done a bunch of work recently about honor. Uh, and one of the things that it seems to me is worth saying to people in what I don't like to call the West, since I think that's not a very helpful term, um, but I'll use it as a, as a shorthand for something that I could say at greater length in a more complicated way, um, is that uh, part of what's going on in large areas of the Muslim world, not just in the Arab world, but in large areas of the Muslim world, is a sense of historical, um, I think historical, uh, loss, failure, perhaps even, and a sense that uh, there's a world outside that looks on in contempt, and that what's needed is to recover a sense of shared honor, a sense that an agency and so on. And in those circumstances, the, the only helpful thing that an outsider can do is to learn enough to be able genuinely to say, I do not have contempt for you. Right? And we don't, that work is not going on. Which means that when people in the Muslim world say to each other or even to us that we have contempt for them, that we're Islamophobic, um, I hope 
that doesn't include me, but I can't deny that it's true of a large part of the world that I come from. And in those circumstances, shutting up and letting people sort things out for themselves may be the best thing we can do. I wish we could do more. But I think sort of everything sounds like just more condescension. Everything we say, even the things that helpful outside liberal folk say, just sounds like more sure. condescension. So I would say uh, there is a genuine problem about relations between um, um, no, I'm not talking about ISIS. I'm, I'm talking about a much wider world of, of un, unhappiness, of, of, of uh, Muslim unhappiness. Uh, I, I, the, I, you know, I think listening, uh, learning, learning to remember that how, how much of value there is in those places, how diverse they are, how not one they are, and so on. Uh, that's what we can do as helpful outsiders, but telling them how to do things is not one of the things that's useful. And just uh, finally, coming back to the concept itself, what struck me, even in the context of this very brief conversation of past and present and there and here, is that perhaps the word cosmopolitanism, in the way that Bakhtin used the word chronotype for the law, that it moves with time and space, that it becomes if you like, a loose idea yes. that retains its core elements within time and space yeah. changes. Sometimes it becomes a set of strategic essentialisms. And other, at other times, the word becomes a way of being receptive to the world is a useful way, at least for me, to, yes. to think of your notion of cosmopolitanism, yeah. that it is a chronotope of, of sorts. I think the, the big intellectual traditions that have names like liberalism, conservatism, and so on, they're not theories, arguments, rigorous sets of consistent some things. They're, they're more I mean, arguments in the sense of arguments in the same direction. They're, they're, there are arguments within all of these traditions. They argue by themselves. So there are only tendencies of thought, and, um, and what makes them useful is that they aren't rigorous. Because if they were rigorous, we'd have to develop a new one for every new complex situation. Whereas, be priced precisely. So, what you get is um, sometimes I'm on an airplane and people ask me what I do, and I'm foolish enough to say that I'm a philosopher. <laughs> and when that happens, they ask me, of course, what my philosophy is. And I tell them my philosophy is everything is more complicated than you thought. 